Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to CC Animal Health CE. This evening is race approved. The subject matter is rehabilitation and small animal practice series. Manage, manage, goodness, management of neurological conditions. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Deirdre Caramonte, who received her DVM from Tufts University School of Medicine. And she is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. She was staff internist and director of the San Tina Santi Flaherty Rehabilitation and Fitness Unit and Animal Medical Center in New York City. She is certified in canine, equine rehabilitation and acupuncture. Current interests are in the fields of rehabilitation, obesity and geriatrics. Currently, Dr. Caramonte is the president of the Veterinary Medical Association of New York City and she is the Director of Clinical Education at ACC Animal Health. We welcome Dr. Caramonte. Hello everybody, thanks for having me and joining us uh, at ACC on this Tuesday evening. Uh, we're gonna talk about some management of neurological conditions. And interestingly, when I was, uh, uh, I guess it was an intern and through my residency um, at the Animal Medical Center, when an animal would come in lame I would immediately go screaming to the orthopedic service for help. But I realized that in the majority of these cases, a lot of them were actually neurological conditions. Um, so I really learned along the way that I actually did like neuro, even though I didn't think I did. Uh, but it's definitely a mainstay of practice if you are in rehabilitation or taking care of geriatric mm -hmm. patients. Okay, there we go. So tonight we're gonna review some uh, the canine neurologic examination, discuss diagnostic imaging, my favorite uh, rehabilitation modalities and some supporting research, and then discuss and show therapeutic exercise, nice isometric exercises to get these uh, dogs up and moving again. <clears throat> uh, the first report of intervertebral disc disease in a dog was published in 1881 and involved a dachshund with acute onset onset of hind limb paralysis. It would take over 40 years actually for the condition to be correctly described in the veterinary literature. And intervertebral disc disease or degeneration is an imminent effect of aging in dogs. In the 1950s, anybody who went through vet school, we learned that in the 50s, uh, studies of IV disc degeneration in dogs were performed by the Swedish veterinarians Hansen and Olsen. And they led us to the first clear description of intervertebral disc degeneration and herniation and explained the difference between chondrodystrophic and the nondrodystrophic breeds with regards to this process. The literal translation of chondrodystrophy is cartilage maldevelopment. There are two most common types. There are some other types and newly identified or newly classified, but we're gonna focus on these two tonight. Classic type one disc disease is common in the small breed chondrodystrophic dogs, such as the Dachshund, French Bulldog, Pekingese, Beagle, Basset Hound, and Shih Tzu. Part of their intervertebral disc undergoes changes resulting in decreased water content, subsequent mineralization causing altered disc bio biomechanics. Continued abnormal forces on the disc will cause the dorsal portion to weaken and the mineralized center is acutely extruded into the vertebral canal, causing a sudden onset of painful neurologic dysfunction. Type, signs of type one disease um, are really rarely noted prior to two years of age. In type two disease, it typically occurs in the non-chondrodystrophic large breed dogs. With this type of degeneration, there are fibrous changes to the disc and concurrent degeneration. This degenerative process leads to the bulging of the central part with gradual dorsal protrusion into the vertebral canal. Clinical signs of type two disc disease are most commonly observed in geriatric animals greater than seven years of age. Pain and neurologic dysfunction in these cases results from chronic compression of the spinal cord and the nerve roots. And just another caveat of the non chondrodystrophic breeds, the German Shepherd is at the highest risk of developing intervertebral disc degeneration and disease at the lumbosacral junction because they have an altered joint angle causing a disproportionately high workload on the neighboring discs, which will predispose it to the degeneration. 
So I think everybody uh, is familiar with the grading system. We're going to do a brief review. So 75 or 85 percent of the cases typically occur um, T11, 12 through L23. And in cervical cases, 15 to 25 percent. And a review of the upper motor versus lower motor, motor neuron signs you get based upon what area um, of that nice long back dachshund there um, will help sort of decide what your um, treatment plan is going to be. In grade one, uh, there is only pain or hyperesthesia without neurodeficits. In grade two, there's ataxia and paraparesis. Grade three presents as a non-ambulatory paraparesis. In grade four is paraplegic. Grade five is paraplegic without pain perception. Um, so there are many different ways, and I actually, in doing some research for this, because um, since we've all been grounded, and I usually like to go and watch other people lecture on the same topic to make sure that I'm up to date on all the uh, new uh, either research or treatment options available. And there are some actual differences in how people, they'll give anecdotal information, which is always wonderful, because I have, certainly have my own. Um, but I forgot where I was going with this, sorry. Um, I'm sure I'll get back to it, trust me. All right, and I can't tell um, who's watching, mostly veterinarians or vet techs, so some might apply, some aspects of this lecture might apply to you guys, uh, vets or techs um, or owners. Uh, diagnosis is the responsibility of the veterinarian. However, the rehab team, which usually consists of a veterinarian leading or doing the treatments, <clears throat> definitely technicians and handlers. And the team needs to be aware of the basic neurologic exam as a way to track, <clears throat> sorry, the patient's progress or identify abnormal changes so the veterinarian can be alerted. As with all other examining procedures, the neuro exam should be carried out in a systematic fa fashion and with the patient comfort in mind. Uh, no exam should be performed without consideration of the patient. If there is an unstable area or a rapid deterioration that needs to be brought to uh, the attention of the veterinarian who is in charge of that case. So depending on whether you're presented with an acutely down dog or a chronic dog, um, I always like to look at gait analysis if that is possible. And in hospitals, unless they're designated for rehabilitation, we want SANAS cleanliness to be of the utmost importance. So they usually have uh, very shiny waxed, very clean floors and they're very slippery for dogs to actually walk over, even dogs with um, that are normal. And another thing is observing toenail length. It's amazing how many dogs have very long toenails and they can't actually ambulate across the floor that well. It's almost like they're trying to grip through a, a tile floor. Uh, if you have floors that are slippery, uh, what we did for a while outside my unit is ask them not to wax them all the time. Uh, you can put carpet runners in the hospital, yoga mats, outdoor carpeting, uh, which is really a, a good way to sort of help. So if you, this you can tell is obviously not a, a big athlete here. Um, and just trying to ambulate that dog across so we can see that dog's, you know, pretty weak in the hind. Um, def the technician is definitely um, helping that patient ambulate across the floor. Um, and we could probably do a lot of good for this dog um, in that rehabilitation area that it's working in right now. Another thing which I didn't even um, realize going through until I think I was in my rehab training um, is besides a lameness scale, or veterinarians love scales for everything, uh, scales for heart size versus um, chest, um, musculoskeletal uh, lameness, uh, etc. And an ataxia scale is really kind of important. It also helps describe to the owner, um, even if they can't see the subtle differences between some of these grades that uh, we can say, you know, your animal's doing much better. It's actually moved from a four to a three, or a three to two, uh, three to four, or four to a five, et cetera. So um, I like having the techs 
uh, use this uh, to grade the dogs as they're coming into uh, for treatment. Once the animal has been observed, gentle palpation of the animal from the base of the skull caudally is important to develop a feel for the animal. And it also allows for the quick observation for gross body abnormalities or dissymmetry. Presence of muscle atrophy is really important and often areas of tenderness and pain or in down animals, areas of callus uh, or hygromas over area that are constantly in contact with the ground. Basic knowledge of spinal pathways is important for understanding the spinal cord reflexes. And they're broken down into two major categories, postural and segmental. Postural reflexes involve functions requiring higher center interaction, whereas segmental spinal reflexes involve functions that are contained and controlled within the spinal cord itself. The postural reflexes shall be considered first and the segmental reflexes second. You're gonna see a lot of this dog. This is Finnegan. And this is the hopping reflex. And the hopping reflex is formed by holding the animal so that only one leg is in contact with the surface or two, depending on what you're doing. Uh, and the animal is using, um, you're absorbing the animals. Uh, yep. And I was trying to talk fast enough to get that point where he was upset about the hopping reflex, but I'll go back. Um, the animal is using only that one leg to support a substantial amount of his body weight while the holder examines the, uh, holds the rest of it. And they can move the animal in a forward, backward, medial, and lateral direction to check the animal's ability to move the leg in the direction that it's supposed to be going. By moving slowly an animal in various directions, the assessment of the animal's ability to form this reaction can be made. The pathways which carry this information from the leg to the higher centers and return to the lower motor neurons from the higher centers are again fairly diffuse in nature, making exact placement of the lesion in this system quite difficult, except um, that we can demonstrate when there's improvement from our treatment plan and what we're doing. Now, I find this fascinating. This is uh, the cutaneous trunk eye reflex is actually a relatively complex reflex elicited by applying a stimulus to the skin, which stimulates a superficial spinal nerve that innervates a particular region of the dermis and will elicit a motor response or a twitch. Uh, the test can be used to help localize spinal cord lesions. If response is absent, the lesion is one to two vertebral cranial to this level as the sensory nerves travel slightly cranial before synapsing. In fact, this reflex is so important, there was a study done, I think it was at North Carolina State, entitled Cutaneous Trunk Eye Muscle Reflex, a Predictor of Recovery in Dogs with Acute Thoracolumbar Myelopathy Caused by IVDD. Quite a mouthful. They took 36 dogs with inter intervertebral disc extrusion that caused paraplegia in the pelvic limbs. Uh, all dogs underwent surgery, and 24 hours after surgery, the caudal border of the cutaneous trunk eye reflex was established, and then again it discharged. So they usually stay in the hospital for a couple of days. The border was reported as moving cranial, caudally, or staying static. Dogs were reevaluated then at 12 to 20 weeks later and 7 to 36 months later. Outcomes reported were improved, unimproved, or um, they were diagnosed with ascending myelomalacia compared to the 24 hour post op cutaneous trunk eye muscle reflex. The cutaneous trunk eye muscle reflex progression was very good, so it actually moved caudal, moved backwards in 19 dogs. So those dogs recovered very well. Then in 11 dogs, the cutaneous trunk eye reflex stayed static. And in six dogs, that border moved dorsally. So, and five of the six dogs in the cranial moving border developed ascending myelomalacia, which is um, end game for them. In 17 or 19 dogs with the caudal moving border showed improvement by 12 or 20 weeks. So just doing that simple test of pinching the skin 
can really help prognosticate how your patient is going to do uh, long term. Patellar reflex uh, is performed while the patient is relaxed. Of course, usually no patient is really relaxed when they're being held down. Uh, the pelvic limb is held in a slightly flexed position with the stifle supported. The patella ligament is tapped briskly. As long as the stifle is not in full extension, a sudden stretching of the patellar ligament causes sudden extension of the stifle. There is uh, some confounding orthopedic disease. Stifle disease may weaken with, um, if there is, uh, the reflex may weaken if there is um, osteoarthritis. Patella reflex tests the femoral nerve and spinal cord segments L4 through L6. All right. Favorite for really sort of classifying these dogs that come in with a um, intervertebral disc extrusion are conscious proprioception, postural reactions, and they test both sensory and motor function and are helpful for identifying deficits um, in strength and coordination. It's done by placing the animal um, obviously with normal footfall uh, in the weight bearing part of the paw and then flipping over the paw and watching for the animal to quickly replace it to normal. This should be repeated several times on each foot. Sometimes depending on how decrepit they are, old they are, you may need to actually support some of the dog's body weight because they have other confounding issues such as osteoarthritis and they can't actually flip it over that quickly. Although this test is not always reliable, can help differentiate between neurologic versus orthopedic problems. Um, the second, and I don't have a slide in there for that, is actually by placing the dog's foot in normal footfall position and uh, placing it on a piece of paper and slowly sliding that, people, that paper uh, outward and seeing how long before they actually realize that their leg is travailing uh, away from their body and how quickly they replace it. So here's, whoop. Here's Finnegan, here's our model, and I don't know why he always looks so upset. He was our, our star model um, in the rehab unit for a number of years, and uh, he knows exactly where his foot is. All right, so we'll move on. So this is um, <clears throat> when you're actually testing. So if gait and postural reactions are normal, spinal reflexes will generally be normal. Conscious proprioception is used to evaluate the nerve function. And I just will pause it. Well, we don't have to pause it there, but um, conscious proprioception is used to evaluate the nerve function and a big predictor of how we treat these patients. Um, this reflex gives a healthy animal the ability to quickly withdraw a limb from a hazardous stimulus. For this test, the patient should be in lateral recumbency and you apply a pinch to the toes. You start out with a gentle pinch and then add more pressure if no response is seen. Now the normal response is flexion of the entire limb, uh, including the hip, stifle, and hock, but it actually has to register in their brain that something's happening because you can just pinch that leg and the reflex will draw it right back up. But just like that animal um, cried out in pain and went to look back at what was happening, that means that is intact. Like this dog has no idea, and we should actually should, she is pinching pretty hard. Um, so animals with severe spinal cord damage might have an intact flexor reflex so that it actually um, does have a reflex, but it doesn't transmit the signal to the brain for the interpretation of pain. So you need to actually make sure that they vocalize or turn the head towards the stimulated limb or an attempt to move away from the stimulus and that animal isn't really doing anything. I think he's actually trying to eat cookies. All right, so why do we go through all of that? So it's really to prognosticate for the owners. So in grades one and two, if we treat them conservatively, and conservative has a very wide definition of what that is, but we know what surgical is. Uh, we're gonna go over conservative options. But surgery, they have a better than 90% um, of recovery, and I think that's actually closer to higher, to 95. In grades three, with conservative management, a little greater than 70% of good recovery versus 90% if they go to surgery. 
grades four, they have about a 50% recovery conservative treatment and about a 90%, depends what papers you read, but 90% um, usually get better with surgery. <clears throat> and in grade five, uh, they do not do well. And the better option is surgery if the owner can afford it. Now, if you do treat conservatively, even though you had some pretty good numbers there, um, they actually recover more slowly and not quite to the level of surgical intervention. And they have an increased chance of recurrence because you have not actually removed the offending uh, traumatic injury to the cord. So that's definitely one thing to keep in mind. Surgery, we know there's an increased cost, there's a uh, risk to, uh, for anesthesia, uh, but we do know that um, you know, it is the best option for the patient with the grade five herniation. Spinal radiographs may show evidence of disc degeneration. So we're moving into the diagnostic imaging part and it depends where you practice and what's available. Um, X-rays uh, can show evidence of disc degeneration, signs of herniation, or like here, a calcified disc, right here. Um, calcification of the intervertebral disc is frequently observed in chondrodystrophic dogs. Um, calcification can be found at any spinal level and can be seen as early actually as five months of age. And the prevalence of disc calcification increases with age, but it does append, a appear to reach a steady state or maximum by about two plus years of age. Increased numbers of calcified discs in the spinal column, they actually are associated with the risk of developing intervertebral disc herniation, but at random spinal levels, not actually at the level where the calcified disc is. Um, although calcification can affect intervertebral disc integrity uh, and the calcified disc can herniate, calcification occurs much more often than herniation. So just because it's there doesn't mean something's gonna happen, although the chances are probably better. Myelogram, uh, that's when I was in vet school, the um, neuro residents or radiology residents would uh, detest coming in to do myelograms. Uh, they were dye studies um, and uh, it was having a good, uh, usually lumbar, uh, stick uh, injection of dye and tracing that up and seeing right there where the arrow is that there's a break in the dye, meaning that's where the dye can't actually get around. Nowadays, I think the gold standard is MRI, and you can see that very clearly, that beautiful interruption in the cord. Um, now, there's a newer technology. Um, I think you guys have probably seen all of the ads for it. Uh, medical infrared imaging or thermography, which is a non-invasive imaging modality that measures and graphically displays skin temperature patterns. So you're like, why would a skin temperature pattern make a difference? Uh, temperature of the skin dermatome is actually directly influenced by its perfusion. It's under the control of the sympathetic nervous system. So any process that actually disrupts that will alter perfusion and thus can change the surface temperature and thermographic pattern of that region. Areas may become warmer or cooler depending on whether the disruption um, is an autonomic, uh, whether the disruption in automatic control causes an increase or actually decrease in blood flow. And there was a study done, I always say recent, uh, I'm thinking probably five, six years ago, actually, um, at, I think it was Long Island veterinary specialist, Dominic Marino's team did a study trying to diagnose uh, thoracolumbar intervertebral disc disease in chondrodystrophic dogs, and it had a pretty similar um, diagnostic ability compared to MRI. So that I like, because it's really non-invasive. Uh, there's some new research out there, and we'll talk about one of the tests, but um, the team I know at North Carolina State are actually looking for biomarkers, um, and what would be nice is if it could be a blood biomarker versus a cerebrospinal fluid, and you have to do a tap to get it, 
uh, but there is a glial fibrillary acidic protein, uh, which actually can uh, elevate very rapidly with spinal cord uh, injury and recover. Uh, it will decrease as the animals get better, um, but it's just not um, a popular lab test right now. I don't know if they're working to get that actually to become um, you know, a commercial lab test. Right now it's research mode, uh, but it would be great if you could get a blood test um, that could work cage side and you could have your answer in a few minutes or a few hours as owners are trying to figure out how much damage to uh, the spinal cord there are, there is. All right, so we're gonna go on to treatment, surgery versus conservative. Um, we're gonna cover all of these issues, decisions, what's going on. All right, so conservative treatment. The purpose of conservative treatment is to allow the spinal cord to recover and we want it to prevent injury. So when is it appropriate? It's appropriate in grades one and two. Um, it's acceptable in grades three and four if the owners cannot afford um, and inappropriate for grade five. We know those animals um, really are going to have a hard time ever coming around from that injury. These animals have to have strict cage confinement for four to six weeks to give that cord a chance to recover and heal. And then we have to talk about pain management and rehabilitation. So if they have motor function, we want to aim to avoid further deterioration of the patient due to herniation of additional disc material while allowing the patient time to recover from that specific spinal cord injury. They should be confined in a crate, not any, not any owner's idea of, oh, well, I can't get up the stairs and oh, I'll just put them on my bed. And, oh, yeah. No, cage confined in a crate. That's like a human uh, having bed rest. Uh, in a crate for four weeks, taken out to urinate and defecate three to four times a day. And at that time, uh, if the owner is taught well, we can do passive range of motion exercises, which we'll talk about in the next section. After two weeks, the amount of controlled exercise, and exercise is a very, uh, uh, probably a, a brave word, uh, it's basically when it's taken out, uh, they can do a couple more steps at a time. Uh, but that dog definitely has to remain on a leash and should be supported by a sling if it's needed and walking only. Pain should be managed and we'll talk about how we're going to do that uh, and whether or not muscle relaxants are needed. The dog should be evaluated regularly for any deterioration in neurologic status, uh, lack of improvement over two weeks, or a decrease in its improvement. Both would indicate treatment failure and those dogs should go to surgery. So depending on when you went to vet school, if you went to vet school, where you went to vet school, and how much you're reading and what lectures you go to, the big question is, do you wanna give these dogs non-steroidals or steroids? Uh, non-steroidals um, <clears throat> serving as the first relay point for the somatic sensory information going to the brain um, the dorsal horn neurons can also be targeted by analgesics, which we're going to cover, and all these dogs are going to be put on analgesics. Um, NSAIDs have both central and peripheral effects. Their anti-prostaglandin characteristics make them appropriate for minimizing the peripheral sensitization of nociceptors and their inhibition of cyclooxygenase within the spinal cord, giving them centrally acting analgesic attributes as well. Steroids, um, and perhaps the most contentious issue is whether steroids should be given for acute intervertebral disc herniation. The difficulty with addressing that question is really complex. How much corticosteroid, which one, which route, and for what reason? Because if you look back at all the research, uh, if they used all different types um, routes of administration, et cetera. Um, the use of corticosteroids can be simplified into two main rationales. The first is to treat pain and inflammation associated with the disc herniation using anti-inflammatory doses of PRED or DEX over a five to 10 day period. 
whether or not surgery is pursued. Now, there's actually no data to support the use of corticosteroids in this way. One retrospective study suggested that corticosteroid use was associated with a worse outcome, but it actually didn't meet the standard of trial to provide a definitive answer. The arguments against corticosteroids used in this way is that why, if they're effective at reducing pain and inflammation, um, if a definitive diagnosis has not been reached, they may be detrimental or at least very least delay pursuing a complete diagnostic workup. And sometimes these animals feel good and then they become more active and cause a dis additional disc herniation. And if used over a prolonged time, they actually may inhibit the annulus fibrosis um, and the spinal cord from healing. So sometimes we talk about steroids and orthopedic disease, you don't want to do that, or sometimes even non-steroidals because it'll decrease healing. There is something to show that steroids may inhibit healing of the annulus. So now my first go-to is using NSAIDs. Um, opioids play a, a significant role um, on descending nociceptive or sensory neuron pathways. Uh, this it's accomplished through many levels, including the periaqueductal gray and the dorsal horn. Um, the periaqueductal gray area is actually the primary control center for descending pain modulation. So that's an important target. And opioids and muscle relaxants can be given. Uh, muscle relaxants are usually thought of to actually be more helpful uh, when the, spain, the, spain, the pain is due to muscle spasm. Um, and usually these occur in more of the cervical cases of cervical herniations. So much of their shoulders and neck muscles are just constantly being tensed. Uh, you can use Valium or Robaxin. Okay. So if the dog has motor function, it should be able to urinate on its own. The owners uh, should be coached in palpation and expression of the bladder and definitely required to seek veterinary help if their dog doesn't urinate voluntarily twice a day. If improvement is seen in the first two weeks, as we talked about before, the conservative route can be pursued and the dog is transitioned to normal activity, excluding jumping and running around, by a gradual increase in exercise between the fifth, so one month later, through the eighth week. So surgical management, um, that goal is to actually decompress the spinal cord and it should reduce the risk of recurrence and it's recommended in grades three through four the non-ambulatory ones and really required in grade five if the owners want to uh, pursue now what happens post-operatively uh well, that should say bladder care uh we want to make sure as we talked about teaching uh, the owners how to manage bladders and so the bladders won't overfill, uh, causing other neurological issues. Um, and also uh, make sure that they're not causing urine scald or burn, and also decubital ulcers if they're laying too much on one side. The skin is actually pretty tough on most of these guys. Um, and skin actually requires hundreds of pounds of pressure per square inch to actually penetrate the skin and cause injury, but a constant unrelieved pressure as low as one pound per square inch can do damage to the skin. So these animals, if they are truly down, they need to be rotated every few hours. And for these dogs um, that are not using their legs, um, for every one day of disuse leading to atrophy, it takes at least three days of rehabilitation to get it back. All right, moving on, so we are going to focus now on um, starting our treatment. So how do we uh, make sure that what we're doing is actually making a difference? Well, one, um, <clears throat> it's important to determine baseline measurements to determine how uh, and if the animal is progressing and the effectiveness. So measurements uh, important for assessing outcomes include the ability to perform functional activities of daily living, gait analysis, um, how the joint range of motion feels, muscle mass, and strength, body condition, and impression of the owners and the veterinarians. Measurements then are repeated periodically throughout the patient's treatment to help assess their progress. 
All right, so passive range of motion, which we talked about before, um, is pretty much the first thing any patient has out of surgery. It's a movement of the limb performed without a muscle contraction because it's caused by actually the practitioner. Additional pressure at the end of a range of motion can be applied and it adds a stretch. Passive range of motion at minimum prevents joint contracture and soft tissue shortening. Uh, so that's part of that atrophy process. <clears throat> it maintains mobility between soft tissue layers it enhances blood and lymph flow and improves synovial fluid production and diffusion. So this is great for any orthopedic condition postoperatively or neurological um, issue. It's important for the, the handler to maintain a range of motion that is within the patient's comfort le level and not to injure the tissues by exceeding their limits. Ideally, passive range of motion should be formed in a quiet environment with the patient relaxed in lateral recumbency. It's best to actually involve only one joint at a time. So like this therapist is actually trying to isolate one joint at a time and work on that one joint while keeping the other joints in a neutral position. The movement should start slowly and progress until the end point of the range of motion is reached. Gentle pressure can actually be applied and held for 15 to 30 seconds at the end of flexion and extension or to add stretching to the treatment if needed. It's re recommended to perform 15 to 20 repetitions two to four times a day and continue until the animal is able to actually voluntarily move their leg and um, move the blood and lymph flow and <clears throat> enhance its periarticular circulation. Uh, let's see. Veterinary literature, anything that we've done actually supports early passive range of motion. So that's good. All right, <clears throat> cryotherapy, immediately following surgery or in any acute injury, um, cryotherapy, um, the initial goals are to control pain and inflammation. Ice packs, cold packs, or ice compression units can be used. Um, cryotherapy, if you just lay something on top, um, only penetrates one to two centimeters of tissue, so its effects are more pronounced in the skin, and compression will increase the depth of penetration. So an elastic bandage can be used to keep an ice pack in place to add compression, or commercial compression units can be used. Care should be taken when adding compression, as the patients may have sign of, signs of hyperesthesia. When used in the acute post-operative or post-injury period, it's best used in the first 72 hours, treat the affected area for 15 to 20 minutes, three or four times a day. And it's important to monitor the skin for signs of irritation and discomfort, especially in animals with decreased sensation. All right, hyperthermia or heat therapy, uh, the effects of absorbed heat are to decrease joint stiffness, relieve spasms, reduce swelling, and increase circulation. And heat therapy relieves pain by activating the gate control mechanism and secreting endorphins to block pain. By raising tissue temperature, <clears throat> the increased metabolism reduces oxygen tension, lowers pH, and increases capillary permeability. Uh, bradykinins and histamine are released, causing vasodilation. Now, moist heat penetrates more deeply than dry heat. Heat should not be used if there is a swelling or edema in the limb or joint, it's usually safe to add heat 72 hours after an injury. Premature application of heat may exacerbate swelling, uh, so if in doubt, apply cold. Laser therapy can be very helpful in the early stages of treatment to help control pain and expedite healing through changes in cell membrane permeability and enhance pathogen combat. Effects of pain relief are due to the result of enhanced endorphin release. Um, laser can also actually be applied to acupoints in the web of the toes to stimulate the neurologic system. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about acupressure or acupuncture later. Electrical modalities uh, also similarly used for osteoarthritis patients. Transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation provides pain relief by stimulating cutaneous pain fibers and basically it sort of tricks the brain to receiving that single tingle and it confuses the brain and the brain actually reads the tingling and not uh, pain perception. Uh, when I hurt my back, I lived in my TENS unit for quite a while. Now neuromuscular stim, uh, and there are um, 
little machines that can be bought uh, fairly inexpensively that can actually do both, but neuromuscular stim actually depolarizes the motor nerve to get a muscle contraction. And that uh, you want to do muscle strengthening. If anybody stayed up late at night in the 70s or 80s, that abdominicizer where people were like doing crunches in their sleep and they didn't even know it and they got a six pack by the time they woke up, that's what they were buying with neuromuscular um, electrotherapy units. And the nice thing about neuromuscular stim is that you can use it actually in these dogs, and you can tell this dog's back is shaved, um, and you can tell that it has the neuromuscular patches on the back um, that um, it supply to the hind limbs and will cause a muscle contraction. The patient resting on a physio ball is in perfect anatomic alignment or at least upright and acting like a dog. So they're always happier doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so this neuromuscular contraction is about 80% as strong as a normal muscle contraction that a dog would do by itself. So 80% is a lot better than nothing. Um, we like to combine them with therapeutic exercises like this resting on the physio ball. Or uh, our favorite, um, pulse electromagnetic field therapy. And in the studies, let's move to the study done at North Carolina State, they took grade five dogs um, uh, that were brought in through the uh, emergency room and they had the um, CC loop pad uh, put on them. And right before surgery, then after surgery, they wore them for 14 days. So they were treated every two hours. Um, and then they moved to twice a day for 28 days. And they evaluated pain sensation, blood biomarkers that I talked about, the glial fibril, fibrillary acidic protein, walking and assessments. So immediately <clears throat> by the next day, their incisional wound pain was down by 50% um, in half of them versus zero in the sham. Proprioceptive place placement was better in the PMF groups by day 42 and the glial fibrillary acidic protein was lower in the PMF group, which was pretty amazing. Second study done by the targeted pulse electromagnetic field therapy was done at the AMC, uh, and this was done in grades two, three, and four dogs, um, and they received them uh, four days, uh, four times a day until discharge, twice a day until um, post-operative day seven. They evaluated 53 dogs for neuro um, and wound healing. They had uh, much better neurological scoring in the treated dogs, incisional scoring and pain scoring. The sham dogs walked by day six. The PMF dogs walked in half the time. And one of the things that I love because it mimicked the human research <clears throat> of this technology is that the sham dogs required twice as much codeine that was administered by the owners. So um, I don't think any neurologic dog, whether it's pre-op, post-op, or no-op, should live without um, an ACC loop or the ACC technology. And it's actually um, something that they can't, nobody can feel, but it enhances nitric oxide production in the body, which is the body's own way. Uh, it's an anti-inflammatory and a downstream uh, target, signaling target for other um, healing cytokines, et cetera. It is uh, FDA cleared in humans for post-operative pain and inflammation. Um, and uh, our research compared to human research is pretty spot on together. All right, land treadmill. Uh, land treadmill I like because it can be used to actually um, strengthen, re-educate, and rebuild endurance. And uh, the, when the sides are down on this, the technician can actually help place footfalls on the belt. Um, and uh, it is a sort of a two-person job, especially if the dog is big. All right, so here's that same little kythotic dog. And you can see that with the therapist stimul uh, holding up, propping up, the dog is having the sensory feedback from the belt as one technician is teasing this dog because he's never gonna get that kibble, um, et cetera. But a land treadmill is a really good technology. And, oh, the sound of a treadmill, I love it. So an underwater treadmill, oh, hey, go back. Um, 
underwater treadmill increases range of motion because there's um, the water is heated. So there's pain relief, uh, better circulation and elasticity of the soft tissues. You can use for strength, endurance, and also it has um, the proprioceptive feedback from the belt going to the dog's spinal cord and eventually brain. Um, and the interesting thing about um, neuro dogs, especially post-operative neuro dogs, is these dogs will walk first in the underwater treadmill um, rather than on the land treadmill. So that's also a really good, you know, if you finally have a dog walking in the underwater treadmill, but the land treadmill, it's not, no fear, it should be coming right around the corner. So acupuncture, uh, when a needle is inserted into and rotated around, collagen and elastic fibers wind and tighten around the needle, causing a mechanical coupling between the tissues and the needle. It first causes a deformation of the fibrin matrix, pulling on the nerve endings and fibroblasts, and it may be interacting on type 1 and type 2 muscle spindles. And there's a whole series of cellular responses that follow, leading to gene expression, protein synthesis, and neuromodulation. And I think that's pretty much where we're going with humans and veterinary research is neuromodulation, um, which will continue after the needle is withdrawn. Needle impulse such as acupuncture bombarding the dorsal horn causing a transient overload leading to a decrease in transmission of pain signals is what happens. Uh, so these guys feel better with acupuncture. <clears throat> now electroacupuncture in this JAVA paper, they actually compared postoperative pain in dogs that had undergone hemilaminectomies. One group had a hemilaminectomy plus traditional analgesic. The second group received the conventional analgesics and electroacupuncture. Blinded pain scoring revealed that the total dose of fentanyl administered to the electroacupuncture cases was lower than in the control cases and the pain scoring was lower as well. So I love those studies when it actually has lower pain scores when they're receiving less analgesia. So you know it's really working well. Uh, continuing on to more electroacupuncture, uh, this is a comparison of decompressive surgery electroacupuncture and decompressive surgery followed by electroacupuncture for the treatment of dogs with intervertebral disc disease with long-standing severe neurological deficits. And this is the one that like you really, you know, these dogs, these owners will come in and they've sat on these dogs that um, they couldn't afford to fix and now they're like, you know, we really want this dog to walk again. Um, but in this prospective clinical trial, um, but they did compare it to historical data they took 40 dogs with thoracolumbar injury. Um, and in this study, the electroacupuncture dogs did much, much better than just the decompressive surgery alone. So I always recommend in my back dogs, um, acupuncture or at least acupressure, if we can point that out. Massage through various techniques. Systematic massage can increase arterial venous and lymphatic flow. It can break down and prevent tissue adhesions. Uh, through sensory input to the peripheral nerves and muscles, central relaxation is achieved. Tissue manipulation can clear edema and muscle spasms, relieving soreness. Uh, it's helpful in healthy tissues as well, but as well, but extremely helpful in atrophied, um, you know, atrophied muscles. Now we move on to therapeutic exercises. Exercises should balance on, uh, should focus on balance, proprioceptive awareness, and strengthening. Standing exercises can begin as soon as the treatment begins. Support can be given using a sling or a physio roll. I like the physio rolls a lot if it perfectly fits underneath your dog. With the patient in a supported standing position, gentle pressure can be applied to the dorsal aspect of the pelvis, like beautiful Shauna is doing here, and it helps sort of the dog to actually do a nice isometric, a non-concussive exercise um, targeting muscles in his hind limbs and his core. Active exercise are similar, except the patient moves the joints through a controlled range of motion exercises. These also maintain normal joint range of motion, prevent contractures. So even if when the dog is in lateral recumbency, not only are you having uh, muscle atrophy, but those joints are atrophying as well, and they're contracting, so you don't want that to happen. So just putting normal range of motion, it'll prevent these contractures, increase circulation, and build endurance within these challenged muscles. Um, 
examples of these can be toe pinching while trying to prevent withdrawal or placing downward pressure on a standing patient. Um, you can put them in slings and harnesses and if you don't have um, a physio ball and try to work on conscious proprioceptive techniques um, or just like I mentioned, trying to prevent the animal from withdrawing its um, toe when you pinch it. Physio rolls, again, they come in multiple different sizes. The prices have decreased phenomenally. There's a lot of um, really good, I like um, Deb Gross Saunders has a whole line. Um, I think it's called Toto Fit. Um, they use in our prevention and protection strategy. So not only are these patients, when you saw these dogs are at risk of herniating again, and when they're discharged from this acute setting of rehab after this one surgical condition, we want them to continue working on their core exercises and strength because we want them not to appear again in our ER needing a second decompressive surgery. So I love these physio roles because they help with balance, coordination, etc. Three-legged standing um, is an example of an isometric exercise. So when you're dealing with that old, decrepit, kyphotic dog, or you're dealing with that post-operative dog, you want something that's not going to shock the whole system. You're not taking it out and you know, bringing them up a flight of stairs. It's literally holding up one leg. And if you want to get fancy even holding up that one leg, you can do gentle um, pushes on the other side to sort of move them just to actually get their core muscles engaged. Um, very good exercise. When they graduate from that, they can do para standing. And the therapist is working really hard not to actually take the brunt of um, the weight of that dog. Uh, so the dog should be bearing most of its weight. Uh, this is excellent for flexibility and strengthening the neck and trunk as well. We like plank. Um, so this is just literally the dog standing on a tactile surface and you could have them planking um, on the front legs and notice that she was gently swaying the back. So the legs were gonna be receiving different proportions of weight from the front. Um, and it's really a great tool to strengthen core muscles. Here's another version of plank, just using a different technique. And um, that dog's more advanced, uh, so it probably doesn't need all that tactile stimulation like the other dog had with those little mini BOSUs, uh, but really a good exercise for these back dogs. BOSU, uh, and a typical BOSU actually has a flat, hard bottom and a top, but this is close enough and very good exercise. So the dog will walk over this, a non-concussive um, exercise, work on balance, coordination, and strength. I, depending on what chair I sit in around my table, um, I have one of these in one of my seats, um, and the nubs uh, provide tactile feedback. So here's an example of uh, somebody trying to help provide tactile feedback, and this is actually on a BOSU. Uh, so she's doing some range of motion, and then just sort of trying to remind the dog that it has a back leg. Then we can move on to some uneven surface walking um, or just sitting, doing a sit to stand on this. Um, and see, so just by doing a motion like that, we can actually have them, it changes a lot of the dynamics for their spine and it's non-concussive, um, et cetera. Then the more advanced dog, and obviously this one is a back dog, a little ataxic, but walk right across that, etc. I know we're getting close to out of time, so I'm just going to run through a couple of these. Then you can put together sort of this uh, whole activity gym for them to do. That kyphotic dog looks a lot better, right? Hasn't he improved during the course of our lecture? We've been working very hard on that, uh, but it makes them think about paw placement doing these exercises. Sit to stands is another good thing when they're much better. And now this dog has actually graduated to having one person. Uh, but when you start, you wanna have a second person hold behind to prevent actually what happened there, having the leg kick out. There we go, that's a much better um, sit to stand. Because um, <coughs> we want when we, train, when we retrain those muscles to actually be correctly trained. Barabelles, um, I got these at REI for 10 bucks. Um, 
I moved out of the city last year and I need a pair of these because apparently um, we have a bear living behind the neighbor's house. Um, but anything that you put on a dog's leg, so it can be a scrunchie, a paper bag, a uh, bear bell, you can put it on the an affected leg. So if the dog is more affected in one area, one side or the other neurologically, um, they'll want to shake that item off the leg. Or uh, you can put it on the unaffected leg and they're going to, is it affected leg, unaffected leg, um, they're going to want to put more weight on that one. So it's just a way of making them think like, hey, something's on my back leg and I need to fix it. Cavaletti rails, here's this little kyphotic pug going through it, doing pretty well. Um, and they're very, very low. They don't have to be high. High is for when they're more advanced. Um, and these are actually on an angle, um, but pretty low. And it just helps them like feedback. Like, what am I doing? I need to get over this. Okay, blah, blah. So assisted ambulation is interesting because um, one, so this dog needs assisted ambulation to go on the belt. This is why I like the land treadmills because you can literally stand right next to them and help them um, ambulate. And this is also on an incline. So more of the weight is going towards the hind ends, building it. Um, this is another version of assisted ambulation. So this dog is in the treadmill. The tech is helping provide the sensory feedback. Otherwise, dogs on in treadmills or swimming tend, if they don't feel like it, not using their hind limbs. So it's always good to have uh, somebody behind them making sure they're not cheating. Assistive devices um, uh, are thinking has sort of come a, quite a long way. Uh, one is that um, we used to reserve these for the end stage. We can't do anything for these guys anymore. Let's put them in a cart, you know, and they'll get around. Well, no, actually, we should actually use them much sooner. So one of the things we like is when they're in perfect posture. So there's a difference between um, the dog laying, you know, on the floor in a lump um, and when the owner can get around to picking it up and putting it in the sling and you know doing all that but if they're in a cart for a few hours of the day they're exercising they're trying to pull themselves around and they're not scraping their toes necessarily and they're working on their core and they're doing turns etc cetera, etc cetera. so assistive devices can and should be used in the interim um, if there are means to do so check toes a lot of these neuro uh, dogs uh, we'll scrape their toes, drag their toes, and we need to just check them. I like to, uh, when they're in the clinic, uh, do a little laser treatment to them. When they're at home, throw the Assisi loop around them uh, to help them heal. It's important to give owners homework, three exercises, three times a day, and have the owners report, keep a journal, because they're also going to guide our treatment plan moving forward. Insurance. Now, this is probably about a year old, but um, what insurance plans actually cover uh, different forms of treatment? And pretty much there's a lot on there. Um, and plans change all the time, so nobody should take this um, to um, as fact at this particular moment. Um, I'll have to uh, see if, uh, I think it was AARV who had updated this. Um, but it is interesting how far we've come uh, in the veterinary world about having um, therapeutic exercises and rehabilitation actually covered by insurance companies. And it's the way it should be, absolutely. If we can prevent another um, intervertebral disc extrusion and emergency surgery, then I would say, yeah, it's great to have them continue on this. So um, all owners should check with their, if they're gonna, if they're gonna have a dachshund, they might as well find out right away what insurance covers um, uh, treatment for disc disease. So prevention and protection, uh, weight management, they can't be obese, they have to stay slim. Uh, modalities we like to use, laser therapy, ice for exacerbations, passive range of motion, um, pulse electromagnetic field therapy or the ACC loop and acupuncture, therapeutic exercises that the owners can do at home, just practice two-legged standing, three-legged standing, planking, BOSU, um, sit to stands, uh, that's just good for good behavior, etc. Um, and 